we're causing so much suffering to animals oh. and it's almost like it's coming full circle and it will be the end of us. That's exactly right. Uh, the death leads to death. And mm. what right do we have to inflict that on these innocent creatures? Uh... <laughs> So here we are still at the vegan camp out 2019. Uh, we've got Dr. Michael Clapper in as a guest. And let me just tell you, I'm honored to have you in. Thank you. I'm honored to be on your program. Now, let's just go straight from the ground up. Um, can you give a brief overview of what you do? Hmm. Oh, my. It's certainly evolved in recent years. Yeah. I'm a classically trained physician. I uh, graduated from the University of Illinois College of Medicine way back in 1972. I've had postgraduate training in surgery, anesthesia, orthopedics. And for the first 10 years of my life, practiced regular blood and guts medicine. Uh, a couple of events happened after my 10th year in practice that made it very clear that I should be adopting a plant-based diet for myself, which my body really loved, but also take that into my medical practice and help my patients who were a steady stream of overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, clogged up and inflamed people. If you get them on a whole food plant-based diet, most of them you turn into normal people wow. and these diseases go away. So I uh, joined the staff of True North Health Center in San Rosa, California and uh, practiced a plant-based kind of medicine, saw wonderful, wonderful improvements in people's health. And uh, I thought that I would finish my career there, but it became very evident a couple of years ago that I have to get to the source of the problem. Mm -hmm. And a major source of the problem is my noble medical profession mm -hmm. has been grotesquely negligent in recognizing the role that our patients' diet are playing in these diseases. And it's, it became completely bankrupt uh, for at least me and I think my colleagues to practice medicine as if what our patients are eating have no effect on these diseases. And uh, that's like someone, a doctor in Flint, Michigan, refusing to learn about lead poisoning when every patient he's seeing has lead poisoning. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a similar thing. So I realized that I want to end my medical career. Uh, hopefully many years from now, uh, by going to the medical schools yep. and uh, of North America. Uh, in, I've been to, to the UK, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and give the medical students the lecture I wish somebody had given me 50 years ago when I was a first-year medical student and tell them, listen, you're not going to be seeing, di and, uh, seeing leprosy and smallpox. It's going to be obesity and diabetes from what your patients are eating. Yep. And so uh, I've been... Uh, uh, devoting myself to our initiative called Moving Medicine Forward uh, to uh, deliver this message to the medical schools uh, in uh, uh, every continent I find myself on. And that's uh, been the most fulfilling part of my medical practice up to now. Wow. So you're going back to the roots, back where it begins when they're getting taught, and that's when they're most open to this. And have you come up against any opposition when you're talking to students? Do they do, do you get cross-examined afterwards pretty thoroughly or...? Oh, absolutely. The uh, the paleo ethic, uh, or paleo ideas, yep. and the keto ideas have really taken hold of my colleagues and uh, and many of the medical students, and and uh, many of them find that they do get an initial improvement in their in their weight and their blood sugar and their lipids, and so they jump on this because they like the taste of steak in their mouth. Uh, but we can talk about why I think that's a terrible idea. Yep. But certainly, uh, from that camp, we get. As well as the professors who stand in the back of the room with their arms folded, uh, who feel this is complete heresy uh, because they never ask about what their patients are eating. Nutrition never figures in uh, to whatever disease they're seeing. And it's, it's so tragic because they're all seeing nutritionally based diseases. The cardiologist is eating clogged arteries, and the internist sees the high blood pressure, and the internist and the rheumatologist sees the sore joints, the dermatologist sees the psoriasis, the pulmonologist sees the allergies, the gastroenterologist sees the colitis, the Crohn's disease. They're all looking at the same disease. It's what their patients are eating. Yeah, wow. And yet, they call it, oh, etiology unknown. We don't know the cause of these diseases, but let's give them some steroids and statins and have them come back in a, in a month or two and see how they're doing. And for scientists, that is so, I've got to be careful about using my adjectives here, but it, it's so 
uh, it certainly doesn't serve the patient, doesn't, no. and, and certainly doesn't give much credit to the doctor either. And it perpetuates; they become enablers of their patients' diseases. It's time for that to end. Mm. The, the medical system is going bankrupt. Real people are dying on real operating tables from operations they don't need. These bypass operations, etc. Uh, most often, they don't need them, and uh, so it's time to change that. So uh, there's resistance. <clears throat> Why is there resistance among the professors? Three reasons. One, we're not taught anything about nutrition, and the word's barely mentioned in all four years of medical school. We don't believe it has anything to do with these diseases. Second, um, nutrition is not viewed with respect. Uh, it's a sissy science. It's not real hard medicine. It's not surgery. It's yep. not cardiology. Yeah, the dietitian will deal with it. And ironically, they're all dealing with dietary diseases mm -hmm. that uh, they refuse to recognize. And third, and the saddest, of course, is that the doctors are eating this food themselves. They're eating the pizzas and the burgers and the lobsters and the steaks. And they're, they're not going to tell their patients not to eat that. Uh, they like that. And so this is this three-headed hydra that we're, I'm dealing with. But it has to be slain. It has, it has to fall away. It is bankrupt to, to turn out another generation of medical students who have no awareness of the role of our patient's daily diet uh, in these diseases. And, and, and that's my mission, is to light those fires in those kids' heads to make them realize that no matter if you're in pediatric clinic, surgery clinic, obstetrics, rheumatology, you're looking at, ask your patients what they're eating. Before you order another $1,000 scan, and another $500 set of lab tests, ask them what they ate yesterday. Yep. And if it's full of burgers and buffalo wings and pepperoni pizzas, then, then that's where you need to start. Send them to the plant-based dietitian down the hall and let her educate them and then see them back uh, in a month and see how they're doing. So it's time to draw on the era of nutritional medicine in, in our healing practices, and that's what I'm about these days. Well, you're very, very passionate. Now, let's talk about this. What about if someone were to say to you, where is your evidence for this? What about, you know, people, they, they see these health benefits from going full carnivore and, you know, from going low carb, but where is your scientific evidence for what you're saying? Oh, Joey, that's a very perspicacious question. Uh, that, that's the real issue um, because nutrition, again, it's been the poor sister of medical research. Mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to do pure nutrition research because, because you're right. They said, where's the double-blind placebo-controlled randomized study? Well, you can't do that in nutrition. People know if they're eating meat or they're not, by and mm -hmm. large, although now there's uh, getting to be some tasty analogs, I suppose. Yep. Uh, and, and these are also conditions over the long haul. These, these take years to develop. Yep. Um, they can often go away quite quickly. But uh, uh, the, the chronicity of this Plus, we're also proving a negative that uh, it's, it's, we're saying that these dietary patterns prevent diseases. So yeah. you're talking about diseases that don't happen. So uh, the, the evidence that we do get is often the epidemiologic. You look at the incidence of heart disease in vegans uh, versus the, uh, the general population, and they... Uh, uh, they said, well, that's just epidemiologic studies. But again, uh, you can't get into every person's arteries and, uh, and do biopsies of the arterial wall. You know, it's a, it's a difficult area to get this solid proof. When you're, when you're just trying to demonstrate the efficacy of a drug, that you can do. You can give a placebo, no, uh, the active drug, and follow them for five years and see what happens. That you can do. But these dietary styles are difficult to do. And also, since you're asking a fairly deep question here, there's also an issue, if we're talking about plant-based nutrition, etc., cetera, um, is how long the person uh, has been on this dietary style. If they, if they adopted a vegan diet uh, a year ago, after, after four decades or five decades of running burgers and pizzas through okay. their arteries, oh, yes, I'm a vegan, uh, and yet they drop dead you know, from a heart attack or they show some disease, um, they'll say, aha, see, the vegan diet didn't work. Okay. But, uh, but your sample was, was skewed to begin with. So it's a difficult kind of research. So, um, so the, the solid evidence they're looking for is, is hard to come by. There are some studies, uh, and as I said, lots of epidemiologic ones, 
Um, Dr. Gary Fraser and the folks at the Loma Linda University have been following uh, vegans in the Seventh-day Adventist community for decades now. Mm -hmm. And it's clear these folks are healthier if they are healthier, uh, if they maintain a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, and we're getting better with our inflammatory markers, with our imaging, uh, to start uh, looking what's happening inside the arteries and what's happening inside these various tissues. So the studies are going to appear more and more. Uh, but again, a, a lot of it's going to be epidemiologic. The, the only thing you can do this to to prove the efficacy of diet is is get a, a whole bunch of people yep. on the exact same diet, exact same diet, follow them for 30 years, 50 years, and see who's still alive, who's yep. had strokes, who's had heart attacks. Uh, you know, that's going to be the definitive proof, and even in a randomized study. Well, you're not going to be able to do that study. You're there, you know, randomized people, you're going to be a vegan, you're not. Yep. People say, listen, man, I'm going to eat what I want to eat. So it's, it's a difficult arena to, uh, to tease out specific uh, objective evidence. And so it's, it's been the Achilles heel of my uh, message delivery. Okay. I, I agree with that. But also, <laughs> the reality is I, I belong to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Well, okay. there's a British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. There's the Australasian Society. There's the German Society. There's the South American and Mexican. Doctors around the world who are practicing lifestyle medicine and getting their patients on plant-based diet are seeing the same thing. Yep. Every physician who practices a lifestyle nutrition-based medicine, we have a stable full of patients who used to have high blood pressure, used to be obese, who used to have diabetes, who used to have clogged arteries. These diseases go away. And as a clinician... You know, I would uh, yell into the wind, don't tell them, we're not seeing these things. Uh, the, you, can, you can sit there with your arms full and say, give us our double-blind placebo control studies. But the reality is these diseases go away, and every doc is seeing this around the world. And, and, to, and to both negate the physician's experience, but very importantly, deny this powerful therapy to our patients and keep them on the statins and the stents and these palliative uh, treatments without getting to the root of the problem uh, really fails the patient. Yeah. Uh, as, as, as nutritional scientists, we're, we're turning our back on the most powerful tool we have at our disposal and the safest tool we have at our disposal. So it's, it's a difficult arena I'm yeah, working in. I understand. There's a lot of variables, that confounding variables. Huge. Why is the Seventh-day Adventist study specifically uh, some of the most solid evidence we have? Indeed, because these are folks who for decades, if not from birth, uh, if they follow the absolute tenets of the Seventh-day Adventist religious philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, they uh, do not eat meat. Uh, they're vegans. They don't eat meat. They don't eat dairy. Uh, now, in the real world, uh, if you actually go to Loma Linda, California, yeah. like I have done, you see a fair number of obese people, and a mm -hmm. lot of not everybody in the city of Loma Linda is a Seventh-day Adventist vegan. But those uh, who have been entered into the registry and have been followed, and who truly, truly do follow a whole food plant-based diet, they are clearly leaner, healthier people. They take less medications. They don't uh, show up in the emergency room or chest pain. Uh, they're clearly a healthier population. Uh, and Dr. Fraser and his epidemiologic crew um, have really documented this beautifully autoimmune diseases, intestinal diseases, uh, and their, their death rate. Uh, everything shows that they're a healthier population. So with the death rate, um, would that be, what would be the main cause of mortality? Ah, that's another classic question. What do these old vegans die of? Uh, and you know, we're all in the hospital dying of nothing. Uh, but uh, we... Uh, the, the body is a very complex yeah. organ, and and again, the, the the those of us who were not raised as vegans, you know, the, the damage we do in our early years, our first 20, 30 years of meat eating, etc., may well uh, turn on genes uh, that uh, a cancer will show up years mm. later in the bone marrow yeah. or in the intestinal wall. Um, living, you know, eating everything from cooked food uh, to breathing polluted air. Yeah. Uh, you know, these things run through our tissues where our, in our cells, our DNA lies unfolded. And, okay. and the food we eat, etc., flows through our, our cells and, and turns on genes and turns off genes. And some of these, again, uh, may set off uh, blood clotting issues. When people get strokes, okay. uh, they may, um, uh, people die of uh, silent GI bleeds. 
when you're 100, 110, your immune system isn't working so well, pneumonias creep into your lungs if you don't clear your secretions well enough. You know, no one lives forever. Nice. The, uh, the mortality rate in, in this room is 100%. You know, okay. no, nobody's getting out of here alive. That's it. And, uh, and, you know, some like, cosmic rays are coming through our body uh, as we speak here. And uh, so there's a fate waiting for each of us. The question is, uh, before that last day on earth, uh, how much joy did you bring into the world, into your own life, into other people's lives? Uh, what, what, what have you learned? How much have you loved? Yeah. And how healthy were you? you know, the, the concept that you're well familiar with of the health span. You know, yeah. There's the lifespan. But if your last 20 years are spent uh, in an old folks' yeah. home drooling, suffering and exactly, then what's the use of living 100 years? You, know, you want your health span to be about as long as your lifespan. Yeah. And, and that's really the name of the game is to stay uh, functional and active and participatory in this amazing life we've been given for as long as possible. And, and the total number of years, whether it's, it's 84, 92, 106, it, it almost doesn't matter. Stay healthy and active and loving all your life. And a plant-based diet will help you do that yeah. uh, better than anyone that I know. So you're saying the best chances of you reaching your genetic potential in terms of lifespan and, you know, some things that are going to come up is if you're focusing on what you can control, which is keeping at whole foods, vegan diet, and you're lessening your chances of these things manifesting in the future as far as you sort of can. Well said. That, that yeah. was beautifully put. Yes. So we're all going to die. We could, you know, vegans aren't immune to things popping up. But let's talk about the number one cause of death for humans worldwide. And are vegans uh, less likely to develop heart disease? Oh, there's no question about that. Yep. I just put a video on my website called Beyond Cholesterol mm -hmm. because I've got a number of vegans walking around with high cholesterols. Uh, and they're very concerned. And some should be, but most don't need to. Uh, and I've made it very clear that these atherosclerotic plaques that develop on the inside of the arteries that lead to heart attacks and strokes, as you mentioned, uh, these don't. Uh, these are not just globs of grease that stick to your artery walls because your LDL is too high. These are inflammatory agents. These arteries are being injured. Meal after meal of bacon and eggs and fried chicken and, and alcoholic drinks and high fructose corn syrup and cigarette smoke and stress hormones and, uh, and all the processing chemicals we use in our food. These are the, the chemical assault that rips up the endothelial, the inner lining of the artery walls uh, that allows oxidized cholesterol to, to work its way into the artery walls and set this set the plaque off. But uh, these, are, these arteries are being injured. This is not a, the person isn't a passive victim. The question is, how is the owner of those arteries treating those arteries? And that's why these plaques develop. And a plant-based diet, uh, as opposed to the, the fried chicken diet and you know, all that implies, uh, a whole food plant-based diet, if every meal is filled with uh, dark green leafy vegetables and, and quinoa and whole grains and papayas and, and whole plant foods. That, the food, the, the molecular stream that then flows through your arteries after a meal like that is so filled with antioxidants and stabilizing agents, they give the chemical message to the tissues of calm down, everything's okay. Um, they don't set off this inflammation. And, and, the, and we can see the inflammatory markers decrease in the artery walls. Um, the plaques actually start to melt away. We, we, there are very dramatic uh, arteriograms that show wow. this. Uh, and so, again, this is not, uh, a heart attack is not something that falls out of a tree on you at age 50. Um, you earn these, uh, these diseases by, again, uh, pathogenic meal after pathogenic meal with, with all that that implies, meat, dairy, oils, fried foods, too much sugar, etc. This is the chemical assault that leads to those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, inflammatory changes. Uh, and if you, if you change the nature of the food stream, as the weeks go by, meal after meal, month after month, year after year, uh, those arteries heal, those plaques melt away, and the artery walls restore themselves. What a wow. beautiful process. So again, uh, much hope for people who've had those you know, heart attacks or want to avoid one. Uh, eat the diet that we're, our body was meant to run on. 
So it's almost like if you create the right environment inside your body, your body will do the rest. Absolutely. It knows what to do. We, we have basically the same digestive system that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have. And they're yep. up in the trees eating leaves and fruits. They are plant-eating creatures. And that's basically who we are as well. And if... And, and to become the carnivorous ape and, and run cooked animal flesh and, and dairy products and find oil through our tissues meal after meal, it violates natural law. And, uh, and, and, and that's where these diseases come from. This is a transgression of the way things should be. You never see gorillas running down antelopes and tearing their flesh apart. You know, the, the gorillas know what to eat. In, in 40 years of medicine, I've never had a giraffe in the office saying, Doc, I, I can't control myself. I can't, I can't stay away from the cheeseburgers. The, the, the animals know what to eat. And, and we are plant-eating creatures. And if we honor that, the body knows what to do with those fuels. And we stay healthy. You know, I'm going to throw something at you that I get a lot in my debates. And it's like, aren't we natural carnivores? And look at these canines and... You know, our, our digestive system can digest meat, therefore I should digest, uh, eat meat. And what do you, what is your go-to response for someone who's, who's been taught that mm. we're actually omnivores or carnivores? Right, yes. Well, um, I feel truly that we are, we are herbivorous creatures uh, on a number of, of levels. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at these canine teeth, uh, I, 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 it's laughable almost to <laughs> Uh, if you think that we're, we're meant to tear flesh, you know, imagine running out to the, on the nearest cow you see, jump on its back, open your mouth, and take a big bite out of its backside. <laughs> what are you going to find? You're going to find your mouth is very small, and your teeth are very short, even your canines, and you can't even bite through that muscle, that animal's hide, let alone its muscle. Um, the, uh, the, car the true carnivores have a hinge-like jaw that opens up and down uh, for tearing flesh. And if you go into the bathroom in front of the mirror and open your mouth uh, and look at your canines, you'll find that they are shorter than your central incisors mm -hmm. do. Where if you look at your house cat's teeth or a, a mountain lion's teeth, you find the canines are much longer than the central incisors. So that's a big clue. And most importantly, we've got a jaw joint that allows for a rotary grinding motion. And you look at our flat grinding molars in the back of our jaw, and you see that we're basically set up to consume uh, uh, plant-based high-fiber material. Now, uh, so what are these canines for? Uh, they, they don't work for, for biting into raw flesh, that, that's for sure, but what they do very well with is the food that really got us through the Paleolithic times. The reality is, if you take the time to go to Africa, like um, Nathaniel Dominey, the anthropologist from uh, Dartmouth did, and examine the teeth of the Cro-Magnon men and, and women and, their, and, their, uh, and the Neanderthals, you find in between the teeth there's starch grains. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you examine the, the, the fossilized fecal droppings, the coproliths, uh, the, the people pooped and their feces turned into stone, when you analyze it, you see the huge amount of fiber these people were eating. Yep. Uh, 100, 150 grams of fiber a day, where most people eat 20 or 30 nowadays. So what were they eating? The truth is that contrary to the Paleolithic mighty hunter myth, I like every Neanderthal had a mastodon in the freezer and spent all day eating mammoth meat because I'm a caveman. The reality is, from the previous evidence I cited, that most of the calories brought into the Paleolithic camp were gathered by the women who spent all day pulling up starchy roots and tubers and starchy corms and gathering edible grasses and berries. Uh, we were starchivores back then. That's where these starch grains come from, and that's what these flat grinding teeth are about, and that's what these short little canines are about. They work great for biting into carrots and potatoes and starchy roots. That's a great use of these canines. And with our very small mouth uh, and short canines, you know, it's clear that we're, we're starchivore creatures that, that live on, on buried uh, roots. You know, that's the main source of our calories. Can we digest meat? Yeah, we can in small amounts. And I don't deny that I'm sure that uh, that is, in emergency famine times, if, if our ancestors came upon a rotting carcass, uh, boy, calories are calories. And absolutely, I'm sure it got us through survival time. But you include meat in the diet on a regular basis. You start changing your gut flora. You start changing the lipids in your body. You start changing inflammatory markers. Um, it's not our food. And, uh, and uh, you start creating changes uh, in the body that are not helpful. 
you, and you eat meat every day, you're dropping down big bolts of carnitine down in your intestines. You'll summon up a population of microbes in your intestines that eat carnitine, and will turn that carnitine into a molecule called trimethylamine, that your liver will turn into trimethylamine oxide. This is a molecule from hell. This molecule drives cholesterol into the artery walls. It uh -huh. really builds plaque up. And our paleo friends, I'm afraid, are going to learn this one the hard way. And, and all the way around, the, the paleo diet, as a physician, I have great concern uh, for the folks eating this diet and are packing their intestines full of meat two, three times a day. That's a great way to give yourself colon cancer. It's a great way to give yourself a stroke or a heart attack. Um, the fats make people insulin resistant. And I feel that these paleo folks, it's going to take five, eight, ten years for these, to, these diseases to manifest. There's already, already been reports of heart attacks in, in paleo folks and keto folks from the high TMAO levels that, that I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> these, this is a diet of death. These folks are going to leap a whirlwind of, um, of you know, clogged arteries, colon cancers, diabetes, autoimmune diseases from leaky gut, uh, strokes, um, heart attacks. Uh, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a diet of death. Uh, it's a... The, that steak may taste good in the mouth, uh, although after a while, you, when you don't eat it, it doesn't even taste good. Uh, but these folks are going to pay a big price. And, and, and I tell the, my colleagues, I say, are you guys going to be around? You're making these, these uh, oh, you don't eat paleo, eat paleo. And then you never see these patients again. Mm -hmm. well, healthcare has become very episodic. The odds of you being that patient's family doc 10 years from now are pretty small. You're going to be around when that patient passes his first bloody stool from his colon cancer. You're going to be around when that lady's lights in 10 years light up from her autoimmune arthritis from the, the leaky gut that your diet has spawned. You're going to be around when, when in 12 years this guy has a stroke from the artery disease. And, and when they get their autoimmune disease, the new doctor is going to say, oh, how did the etiology unknown? We don't know why you had developed that colon cancer. We don't know why you developed that lupus. But he's picking up the pieces of the wreckage that was started by that other doctor with their recommendations a uh, year, decades before. And I tell the docs, you know, that adage we practice by, do no harm, applies to dietary advice too. Yeah. And these young docs and, and pseudo docs were throwing out this, ah, oh, everybody ought to eat keto, everybody ought to eat paleo. They, they don't know what they're saying. Yeah. They don't know what they're doing. And there's going to be some severe medical karma as a result of that advice. It seems like you're speaking from a deep place of experience and you might have seen a lot of suffering as, as a doctor. So I feel this um, emotion coming over me because you're speaking from a place of watching people suffer these horrible outcomes from their, their dietary choices. Absolutely. Uh, these are not random events. The body is not capricious. It doesn't say, so, oh, I think I'll develop lupus today. I think I'll develop uh, clogged arteries today. Uh, I had a professor say, you know, people... People don't get diseases, they earn them, you know, mm -hmm. meal after meal. And, and that's what I see, and it's wretched to see people with, with Crohn's disease and colitis and, and uh, autoimmune arthritis and, and strokes. Uh, these are all preventable diseases. If, if you raise a child from infancy on a whole food plant-based diet, there's no reason their arteries should ever get inflamed. There's no reason they should ever develop a spot of plaque in their arteries. There's no reason their gut should get leaky. There's no reason they should develop arthritis. They should go through their life as a healthy homo sapien for as many decades as, uh, as uh, they can manage on this planet. Uh, but these diseases, that this plague of diseases we're seeing, uh, we're all playing innocent victim. Oh, Americans are ill. The, uh, the Brits are ill. Why are they ill from what they're eating? Yeah. And, uh, and it's time to stop running away from that reality. Do you feel like you're up against the odds here? Yes, but, uh, but I really feel that the, the tides are shifting. Yeah. The, 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 the evidence is becoming clear. Every day you see articles showing up in the medical journal about plant-based diets, uh, preventing or reversing diseases. Uh, you see... Uh, the, the converse, you see studies showing that high red meat diets increase the risk of various diseases. Absolutely. But the, 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 the public is, is, something has changed. You, you're starting, well, it's happened, in the, you know, 10 years ago, you started seeing all these plant-based uh, entrees showing up on the restaurant menus. 
and then you go to the, the first the natural food stores, you see the plant-based uh, entrees, but then in the regular stores, you're starting to see them. And then the advent now of the impossible burgers and the, and the, and the, and the fish and the, you know, the phony fishes and all these things, which I welcome. Yeah. Uh, no, they're not the healthiest. Uh, you know, you know, they're, yes, there's a lot of refined proteins and oils. But if it, it, if it gets Joe Meat Eater off his beef burger on, yep. onto an Impossible Burger, I'm all for that. <clears throat> they are healthier. They don't have cholesterol uh, to be oxidized. Uh, they don't have uh, a new 5GC, that uh, cyanic acid in meat that causes inflammation. They don't have endotoxin from the slaughterhouse. Uh, they're inherently healthier in that way. But all the way around, it's helping society see itself as a non-meat-eating society. Yeah. And that's the most important thing, that we can make this transition. So the wheels are starting to turn, and, and I'm mildly optimistic. Wow, and, and you've been around fighting this fight for many more years than I have. And have you ever felt like, you know, maybe this isn't achievable or... There's a good, good chance we're not going to make it in time. Yes, yeah. we, we, we've, we've piddled away. The, in the 70s and the 80s, I was, I was in making these speeches. You know, so it's time we got to switch our fuel supply. We got to switch our, our diet. And people were too busy into, into disco and sports and, yeah. uh, and shiny objects. And it's still going on to a large extent, though that's, that's starting to change. Uh, but we piddled away important decades where we could have made this change. And now yep. we're way behind the curve. And the ice caps are melting. Mm. Uh, and, the, and the Amazon's on fire. And it's from our wholesale production of flesh, of animal flesh. That's why they're cutting down the forest. That's where these fires are coming mm. from. That's why the world's getting hotter. Uh, and that's finally, I think, seeping into people, especially the young kids. They know. Yep. They don't have the loyalty to the steakhouse that, yep. uh, that our, our parents did. And so, um, so if, if we, if nature will eke out enough time for us uh, to make this transition uh, to a plant-based diet, everything will start to change. The forests come back. The CO two is taken out of the air. The waters run clean again. The soils stabilize. The uh, uh, greenhouse gases reverse, and where we wind up with a stable ecosystem again. So it's doable. Uh, it depends whether we have enough time, but. As Dr. Richard Oppenlander, in his wonderful book that I recommend called Comfortably Unaware, which is just where the meat and dairy folks want us, yeah. uh, he says, you know, you, you can put solar panels in everybody's house, you can give everybody an electric car, but unless we adopt a plant-based diet on a massive scale, none of that's going to make any difference. It must start with the world going vegan, quite honestly. It's interesting how we're, we're causing so much suffering to animals. Oh. And it's almost like it's coming full circle and it will be the end of us. That's exactly right. Uh, the death leads to death. And, mm. and what right have we to inflict death on such an industrial scale? A million chickens an hour in America have their throats cut. What right do we have to inflict that on these innocent creatures? Uh, you know, the, the mighty hunter a million years ago and starving to death and he shoots a deer. You know, that's one thing. But, for, but the massive amount uh, of suffering we're causing to create this huge amount of animal flesh so we can eat the, pop those buffalo wings in morning, noon, and night, um, that's such a transgression of, of everything that is, that, that is ethical uh, yeah. in, in the human experience. That the, um, and the animals, you know, they, they get, they're going to get their revenge. And they're innocent. No cow wants revenge. No. But the truth is, you know, I, I had to... Uh, uh, take a little sang Freud, I must admit, uh, when it, uh, a hurricane went through North Carolina uh, a couple of years ago, and the massive amount of pig installations they have there with these sewage ponds. Well, the, the water just swept through, and this massive tide of pig feces wound up in everybody's homes and their offices and their restaurants. And I had to say, you know, there's a little bit of justice. Uh, there, the coming. message was yeah. delivered by the pigs on that one. And, and then the, the, the politicians don't say that we're doing something out of truth when, when I've got pig manure up on my living room wall here eight feet high. And um, so, yes, you're right. It's, uh, we're, we're, 
it's so insidious. The, the factory farm sheds are out of sight. You know, it's an anonymous shed up in the hillside that you see as you drive down the interstate. You know, don't worry about what's going on in there. Well, that, you can't keep that secret any longer. And yeah. It's coming out in, in both our disease spectrum and the environment. And, uh, and the ice caps are melting. So all the way around, you're right, the, the chickens are coming home to roost. Yeah. And, like, from your experience in this arena, like, obviously the public are contributing to something that I feel that most of them are morally against. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that people go with that? Like, the, the, their actions coinciding with their belief system against, you know, this, this cruelty? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and that's the hope uh, in that... No individual, even the toughest meat-eating guy, if you gave him a, a knife and, and put him in a room with a calf uh, or a pig, okay, you got to kill him uh, to, uh, to eat tonight, yeah. darn few of them would pick up that knife. They yeah. don't want to kill that animal. Yeah. You know, most people love the animals, the truth of it is. But as long as it's invisible, I don't see it, somebody else is doing it, uh, just give me that piece of, of anonymous flesh here. Yeah. Uh, and... And we've allowed that, that we've given people a pass yeah. you know, from where their food really comes from. Uh, and, and part of the vegan movement, and God bless the animal liberation folks who, who put that in the, the people's places. Yeah. You can't, this is what's really happening. This is what's required to get that piece of flesh on your plate there. Uh, they're, they're heroes uh, for, for bringing the truth to everyone. So, um, so that's... You know, it's a delicate line that, that uh, the animal liberation folks walk, like I have to walk. Um, you don't want to turn people off, yeah. but you want to shine that light of truth. Um, yeah. So they say, you know, that I don't want to contribute to that anymore. And, and all it is is uh, ordering the bean chili instead of the beef chili. You know, that's the huge sacrifice we're asking people to make. Yeah. Yep. If people would just take that step, everything would get better, including them. Yeah. So, um, yes, it, it, appealing to their better nature is, is, is an important uh, ticket to getting action that matters for these folks. So how does this happen? How does, uh, you know, I believe human beings innately are compassionate they see violence it turns them off they're not like a lion they see a limping animal they don't want to attack the animal they want to help the animal so how does this happen that we've been you know we're contributing to something so violent and it's so against our innate nature yeah uh, again there's a, a, an innate fear of course we're humans and um, they're just animals and so you know because we can do something then then we do it but also, it's so ingrained in our, in our culture, and it's a cultural thing. You can certainly raise a child as a vegan, and I've seen dozens of them now grow up as beautiful, lovely, healthy human beings. But at age six months of age, when the baby is still nursing at the breast or on the bottom, with all the love in the parent's heart, your mother didn't know, my mother didn't know, but with all the love in their hearts, at six months, that jar of baby lamb and baby chicken and baby turkey is open. And from that point on, three times a day, animal flesh gets slathered on that child's intestine because we think that we're doing something good. The boy, the child needs protein to grow and, and they're going to be eating meat anyway. And so it started so early. And, uh, and then they, by age two or three, they're eating their Happy Meals in the fast food restaurants. And we, we get them on this fast food uh, diet very quickly. And yet the child really doesn't know what's in that burger, doesn't know where that chicken wing comes from. And, and so we just uh, and train folks uh, for, a, um, uh, for the long run very early. And by the way, I know we're running short of time here, but for the folks who, are, who run into the failed, I tried to be a vegan once, didn't work for me. Now I eat some meat and I feel better. Or the athletes, I eat some meat before my athletic endeavor. What's going on with those folks and, and why do they relapse? I think, and, and research needs to be done, but I think what we're seeing is the mechanism I just mentioned. Our muscles are capable of synthesizing important muscle-based nutrients, carnitine, creatine, myoglobin, etc. And uh, we have the genes to make those. But if those molecules, those muscle-based molecules, are coming into the body three times a day, morning or every meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, flowing through the tissues all through infancy and, and uh, childhood and, and adolescence and your teens and 20s and your 30s, uh, what are your own genes going to do? They're going to downregulate your own production of, of these molecules because it's coming in free, pre formed three times a day. Well, that gives you a dependency on, on those molecules. And when you say, if you suddenly go vegan at age 30 and suddenly those molecules disappear, now you got to make them all on your own right now. 
Most folks can gear up their cellular machinery to do that, but some things a bell-shaped curve. Some folks, it may take them weeks, months, years to finally gear up their own carnitine production. And during that time, they draw down on their own stores of these nutrients they don't feel so good. And then they eat that piece of meat, and it flushes their tissues, and whoa, they feel better. And I'm vegan, schnegan, I'm a carnivore. But what are we witnessing? This is not normal human physiology. This is an acquired dependency created in, from feeding a human infant animal flesh three times a day in childhood. Yeah. You can create a dependency on these uh, molecules. But so what? That's not normal. That's not natural. Uh, we, we've, we've created this phenomenon. So, uh, so to those folks, uh, you know, that I say, first of all, be patient. You know, eventually, I had meat cravings for years after I became mm -hmm. vegan. Uh, and my body was certainly used to those molecules. Um, what can what can be done? Um, either we have to do some serious research. What are the carnitine levels? What are the creatine levels these folks are? Is there some supplement that could be engineered? I don't know. Don't feel great about keeping that dependency going, though. It has to be part of a tapering down program over yeah. many months uh, or years. So you feel like some this. people might need to transition a little some bit slower. slower. Absolutely. But I that think. wouldn't be true of everyone. Just mm -hmm. see how you feel and how exactly. you're going. And let's just um, finish off with something like your own... You, you're leaving quite a legacy behind. I feel that like you're one of the most instrumental speakers in the, in the plant-based arena, and you've, you've mm -hmm. got a lot of experience behind you. What would you what would be your advice to up and coming advocates in and try to adapt to the animal rights arena the, the plant based uh, health arena and also the environmental what would you leave them with advice oh, right oh my <clears throat> um, it's it's been so interesting I'll, I'll I'll try and formulate the answer to your question in a minute yeah. but um, and throughout I've been advocating plant based diets for over thirty eight years now wow. and um, and during it, I certainly played the health card as a physician. That's yep. been my lead in, of course. Uh, and I'm uh, an ethical vegan at heart. Uh, my love for the animals usually seeps in towards the end of a talk. Yeah. Uh, but I'm a passionate environmentalist. And, uh, and so I was always, especially since reading John Robbins' book, Diet for New America, and other ones, it's become very evident what our meat-based diet is doing to the planet. So I certainly make that pitch. Uh, and they've been fairly evenly the recipient of my energy. But now with the ice caps melting and the temperature going up and the, and the, and the world getting warmer, the environmental uh, part of that triad is now becoming so overwhelming, it's threatening all our existence. Every little child I see at this festival, I want to go up and apologize to them for what we've done to their planet. And my God, my child, what is the world going to be like uh, in 30 years when you're my age, or uh, 70 years when you're my age? And um, so now the, the environment has really stepped forward here. It's by far the power card that really has gotten people's attention here. Mm -hmm. And the connection with the meat is as much as they hate, they have to recognize that it's the meat. Yep. And, oh, man, uh, they don't want to open that door. But it's the truth of it. Yep. And they say you can't keep a hat pin in a cloth bag for very long. You know, when yep. it comes out, and there's no there's no keeping that door closed. And so, um, so I would uh, urge people to to uh, advocates one know what you're talking about. Read the books. Read Dr. Oppelander's yep. books. Uh, wa watch the videos. Know what you're talking. Know know the connections here. Uh, and know the the don't just be a doom and gloom person. Paint the picture of what the world would look like. A vegan world tomorrow would be a healing world on every level. The people would get healed. The waters would get healed. The earth would the air would get healed. So um, so emphasize the positivity of uh, uh, of how a plant based diet fixes our problems because it really is the solution. It's just what the doctor ordered. Uh, and uh, so I would say uh, uh, know, know your lines, uh, yeah, school yourself, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and lay out the positive vision of what a plant-based diet will do. Amazing. And I suppose we need to maintain perspective as well and keep all of these in the forefront of our minds, like the environmental destruction and what's it's, it's the sense of urgency. Would you say that helps keep you going? Oh, absolutely. Um, there, 
knowing what I know, when I see the, the medical reversals of disease I read and see every day uh, keeps my health uh, juices going. Um, but knowing all those animals in those sheds, uh, I owe them so much uh, uh, for what we've done to them. And, uh, and the planet, which I love so dearly, uh, there, there's, there's no place else to go. There's nothing else to do with this planet. I'm working for the kids and I'm working for the animals. Uh, they're, they're my employers at this point. And, and how can you lose enthusiasm for, for those two very important constituents? Well, on behalf of the Earth and the planet and the animals and, and all of the, the movement that you've inspired as well, thank you very much for all of your work. Oh, thank you, Joey. It's been an honor. Thank you so much for getting this word out to people who need to hear it. Thank you so much, mate. Thank you. All right. Amazing work. Thank you. Amazing speaker. Oh, Absolutely thank amazing. Thank you. thank you so much for that. No, I like you from the first time I saw you on the street, you, man. You're, you're a good one. You're, you're a unique man. Yeah, I've got you're my own way of saying things. You do, but very clear, and you're using your energy for the, for the best. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, great. For I've got a lot of respect for the amount of time you've been doing this because I, it can be a tough battle. You know, in 1981, there wasn't a lot of sport back Driving then. out for a bottle yeah. of soya milk. <laughs> yeah, that so. was all of it. It was powdered yeah. soy milk. And, uh, and some, um, some tired old lettuce in the corner there. That was about it. It must feel good to see things picking up. Oh, and... man. It's, it's, yes, after all these years at the coal face, you know, the wheels are starting to turn. Look at this. There yeah. are thousands of vegans. My God. Amazing. It's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It gives me hope. Absolutely. Amazing. Absolutely. Well, thank you so okay, much, mate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Keep it up.